Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for showing up for my um, lecture here about impurities, position of uh, the regulatory authorities worldwide, like the FDA and the European Medical Agency. My name is Christian Seiner. I am the product manager at LGC. And what I would like to do today is I uh, would like to talk you through uh, the fundamental guidelines from ICH on impurities first, um, then the influence on uh, the ICH um, of the ICH impurity guidelines on testing on generic drug substances and drug products. We will have then a quick look on uh, reference standard type for impurities and at the end some practical validation examples that you can do with, uh, um, with those impurity reference standards. So quick information, you, you will know that, but nonetheless those who do not know it, um, ICH is the International Conference on Harmonization and uh, members from regulation authorities are sitting there together with members from the industrial pharmaceutical associations from the three major markets, Japan, Europe and the United States of America. And um, the guidelines are not only considered in those markets, there is also the uh, pharmaceutical inspection convention scheme, um, cooperation scheme as well, where you have 48 members uh, of authorities sitting there from all over the world, a, a nice mix there, four different partners um, as well. And, um, and they also look on what ICH is doing and are applying those, um, um, those rules in their countries. They are also considered by, by further countries as well. For example, only um, beginning of this year, Brazil um, set up a regulation where they are saying we will also now follow the ICH guidelines and they also are looking on, uh, on the thresholds there from, from ICH as well. And these thresholds are, um, are shown here in the, um, in the next slides. Well, sorry, not, not in this one here. Um, right now, in the next slide after that, but ICH set up uh, three guidelines uh, for impurity testing, Q3A and B and C. There's a third one, uh, a fourth one on its way on heavy impurity, uh, heavy metals impurities to come as well. Um, they expected already to have it in the official status in September 2014, but they are not ready yet. So, uh, but it will come, become official um, quite soon, I'm, I'm sure. So, and what we, what we have on the, on the next slide here is then the threshold table from ICH for impurities. And what you need uh, to, to look after is when you have a drug substance that is administered less than two grams a day or not more than two grams a day, then you have to report every impurity above that threshold here. You have to identify every impurity that is above the threshold of 0.10% and you have to qualify. Qualify means to show that the substance, the impurity is not doing any harm to the patient for the duration of the use. Um, that this impurity is not doing any harm, that is meant with qualification. And qualification you need to do for any impurity there um, that is above the threshold of 0.15%. Uh, when you have a drug substance administered, then uh, more than two grams a day, then there are uh, lower thresholds applying that you, uh, that you see here in the second row um, of the table. And we will see in a, in a few monograph examples that I will show you in a, in a few slides. Um, we will see um, that uh, these reporting thresholds here are now also adopted by EP in their, in their new monographs. We will have a quick look on, on three um, examples there as well. Right, let's have a look already on, uh, on how the ICH impurity guidelines influence um, the generic drug substances and products. Because they were originally developed for new drug substances, as you could have seen in the title of, of the ICH guidelines, but they are applied now worldwide also to generics and it will be, uh, um, in the next years, it will become even further so. So let's have a look first on, on Europe and let's have a look there in the European Pharmacopeia. There are two documents of that are of importance, the general monograph there um, with the number 2034 about substances for pharmaceutical use and the general chapter control of impurities for substances in pharmaceutical use. And these two documents, what they do is they link um, all the pharmaceutical monographs, the monographs from the European Pharmacopeia, they link those monographs to the thresholds of, of ICH, which uh, are displayed here once again. We have seen that in, in uh, magnified the slides before. Um, we stay in Europe and we have a look what the European Medical Agency is saying. And they are saying in their guideline, this is an internal guideline that they have, and uh, they are saying there in their guideline um, to, uh, to their workers that they should not grant marketing approval when the marketing approval, when the documents, the dossier is uh, based on, on monographs 
that are not compliant, uh, com not compliant yet with uh, with the two documents that we have seen before. So it means when they are not compliant with ICH guidelines. And what they are also saying, what they are also doing is they they say to the workers at ADQM that are responsible for setting up the certificates of suitability, the CEPs, they are saying. Um, um, you should not, that they should not grant those CEPs when they are based on the old monographs still that are not yet compliant with ICH with the two documents that we have seen here. And that was the reason why a lot of, of CEPs from China and India were not extended in the, in the past or were, um, were also uh, withdrawn from the suppliers um, because for some time they were not compliant with the new monographs, not compliant with ICH. And it's getting better now. You, you're getting now drug substances again with a, with a good CEP. Um, but, but for some time that was a problem. Um, because all the monographs changed since uh, 2003, 2004, it started to change those monographs. And f three years ago, um, um, the EDQM um, in the European Pharmacopeia, they were really um, able to, uh, um, to convert all the monographs, they're the relevant ones, into the new, um, into the new form. And I've brought a few examples with me here. Um, a lot of these uh, monographs changed, for example, from thin layer chromatography on impurities, they, they changed to HPLC related substances methods, and also they, they changed to different limits there because there was some work to do for, for the ICH, for um, limits for the ICH thresholds as well, where the monographs were not yet compliant. So there are now three, um, three monographs that I brought with me here. First one is acetyl acetylsalicylic acid. In January 2008, it was still with that limits here. Um, but um, then in, with the monograph 2011, um, that changed then. So you have now here, you have not had any um, specified impurity really mentioned. You have now specified impurities A to F in the, um, in the monograph for acetylsalicylic acid. And uh, you see they should not have, not have more than 0.15% than there. Um, the unspecified impurities, and that is f exactly the reporting threshold that we have seen from ICH and all the monographs now in, uh, in, uh, um, in the European Pharmacopoeia. Sorry, that is not the reporting threshold. That is the identification threshold here for a substance mo um, administered more than two grams a day. That is the identification threshold. So the unspecified impurities you should have below the limit of 0.05%. Uh, Otherwise, you need to identify those as well. And you can't do that by the work with the monograph. That's not possible. The monograph is not giving you any advice on which other impurities are there. It's only for the specified impurities that you have means of identification there. Right. And then you have the total impurities that should not be more than 0.25%. That did not change here. Um, and the disregard limit, that one is the reporting threshold that we have seen in the table from ICH for substance administered more than two grams a day. Um, the next one, amlodipine basilat, you see it here. There are thin layer chromatography and HPLC methods already um, in, in January 2008. And in April 2009, um, the TLC method were, were skipped and it's now only HPLC. And uh, you see here, that, uh, for example, A to F are now specified impurities with that limit here. Um, and you see that, uh, for example, if you look at impurity D here, that changed now. So you are not allowed to have 0.3%, but you are only allowed to have now, um, D is also a specified impurity here, but you are only allowed now to have 0.15% uh, for that. If you cannot keep that specification, you need to go into the qualification procedure. Um, it's possible to do that, but it means a lot of work for you, um, a lot of um, money to take into the end, into the end, maybe for toxicology studies. So um, other unspecified impurities you see here, that uh, um, is the identification threshold for a substance administered less than two grams a day. Um, or not more than two grams a day, and uh, the total impurities you are allowed to have 0.6% uh, here. And the last um, example here, yeah, disregard limit, that's the reporting threshold that we have seen in the table from ICH. And the last example here, um, that's for ibuprofen, quite, quite a, a, a popular compound, of course. So you see here, that is um, the most interesting one. For example, you can have a look here. That were specified impurities back in, uh, in 2008. The impurities now, the specified ones by the HPLC procedure, are just A, J, and N. And you see they changed here uh, quite, quite a lot from 0.3% here as well 
to uh, to 0.15 percent, and for the unspecified impurities, and you see here, the specified impurities are only A, J, and N, and the unspecified impurities are C, D, B, E. So you changed here from 0.3 percent, you changed to to now a limit of 0.05 percent. So that's quite a change for an impurity. That's quite a change for an impurity, and uh, that's one of the reasons why a lot of CEPs were not really uh, um, extended or were withdrawn, and, and only now it's, it's getting better again because they got adopted to, to that procedures. Total impurities, yeah, the disregard limit, we have seen that, again, once again, the reporting threshold for a substance administered more than two grams a day. So uh, that's about um, the, the monographs there and, and EP and, and Europe, and if you have a look on, uh, on the USA, um, very recently, it's not very far ago, um, in May, June 2014, there were two draft chapters for impurities uh, um, provided from, from USP. Um, that is a completely new one, 476, and it's a mandatory one. And that one here, the 1086, that is just an amended one, um, but it is referred to in the other monograph, in the other new chapter here, so um, it, is, it is mandatory as well. And uh, this is also featuring now in the draft the ICA thresholds that we have just seen. And um, that new um, um, chapter, uh, respective theory, the amendment of, of the 1086 uh, chapter here, that was necessary because USP needed to be consistent with, uh, with the FDA approach. And uh, the monograph changes are already ongoing there in the USP as well. So, and, and the FDA, um, they were um, in the United States, they were a bit quicker than the USP, and uh, as it was in Europe as well, with, with some delay there um, from, from EMA and then um, the, the, the European pharmacopoeia. Already in 2009 and 2010, the FDA issued their two guidances on impurities in drug substances and in drug products there. And what they state there is that they knew that Q3A and Q3B were developed for the NDAs, for the new drug applications, but they, they think and take the position that the principles of ICH should be um, applied to, to the abbreviated NDAs, of course, as well. And that's the quotation from here. So, uh, so that makes clear in Europe and in the United States that you have to be uh, compliant to ICH also for generic products. And um, in Japan, the, the other market of the ICH regions, they are not yet that, that far, but there's also that decision uh, um, outstanding and it will, I guess in, in, in one or two years, it will also come there that you need to check um, on the generic products as well, especially when they become more um, important, more popular in Japan as well. So far, the Japanese market is very much still on original products. But anyway, generic products will also come there, and with that will also come the impurities, testing on generic products in Japan. So let's see what, what is uh, um, FDA further saying there. How do you set your acceptance criteria on impurities uh, for, uh, according to the FDA guidances? And they are saying, look into the pharmacopoeias first. They mentioned the USP, but I'm quite sure if you don't find a specification there for one of your impurities that you look at, that uh, you also then can look onto the European pharmacopoeia or maybe the Japanese one if a limit is provided there so, so that you can find there that limit. Um, and if the impurity is specified, for example, in USP, then you should keep that specification. If you can't do it it's the same as in the European pharmacopoeia, um, then you would enter with that impurity into the qualification process, showing by tox studies or showing by literature comparison, or if you are lucky, showing to in comparison to the original product that, uh, that your impurity is not doing any harm to the patient during the duration of use. But when it comes into toxicology studies, then uh, it's, it's cost intensive and it's delaying your time to market uh, considerably. If the impurity is not specified in the compendia in the USP or in any other um, compendia, then what the FDA is saying, use our decision tree that we provide with the guidance. And uh, that decision tree I have with me here. We don't go into detail with that, but I just want to point out two sections um, in the decision tree where it makes sense to, instead of just assuming the same analytical response between the API and all the impurities that when you are at that point where you are asked to reduce an impurity to a safe level or to lower than the qualification threshold, that you then, before you really do that physically, reduce that substance, that impurity to a safe level or to the qualification threshold, that you check with a dedicated reference standard if you are really above those levels, the, the threshold for qualification or the safe level here. 
because a little bit investment in a reference standard and some analytical work might save you that part, purifying the API or changing the drug substance supplier or changing the, the, the route of, for the drug substance, the synthesis route for the drug substance. So that you should really consider there. And with that, with that I am already at, uh, at, my, at my main point here. We will talk about reference standards for impurities for, for a few seconds here as well. So um, I'm probably telling quite quickly here, but that is because I have a lot of information on the slides. If you want to, um, you can give me later your business card and I can, can uh, send that uh, presentation, of course, to you so that you have all the information then in there and can, can go through it once again. So, right, let's have a look for reference standards on, the, uh, um, on reference standards for impurities. There is not too much guidance from authorities there. There's a lot of guidance for the APIs, what you should do for primary standard or for a secondary standard. But for impurity reference standards, there's not so much. The ICH guideline is saying they should have, um, um, they should be um, evaluated and characterized according to their intended uses. Well, that is a broad um, interpretation. Um, we have here in Germany, uh, sorry, not here in Germany, I am from Germany, and we have in Germany, we have our authority, uh, the B farm, that issued a document and translated uh, the section there, the relevant section there is saying that impurity standards uh, should be, um, can be used for development and validation of those tests, and we will have a few examples on validation there, what you can do with impurity standards later. Um, but what you, what you need to have there is that um, at least the identity must be ensured and, and also when you use them quantitatively or also semi-quantitatively, you should have the purity and the assay defined there as well. Um, the following certificate, that is one example of our impurity reference standards uh, that, we, that we have and that is um, normally always accepted. And I also have uh, one uh, feedback from a customer there that I would uh, like to share with you after the after we had a look on the certificate here. So we will go quickly through that certificate. Um, those of you who have attended uh, further courses, uh, sorry, not courses, but, but lectures here during CPHI Speakers Corner or ICSE, will know already about that certificate. We have a very detailed one on our impurity reference standard. That one here is for the sulfur and anoxide impurity of omeprazole. So some general information on the first slide and then starts our um, identity section. So we uh, we provide the NMR spectrum. We have the interpretation of that uh, spectra always in our files. We don't have them on the certificate. If you need the interpretation there as well in order to make the identity for yourself waterproof, 100% waterproof, you can ask for that interpretation and we would give that further information for, uh, for a special fee. But normally you, are, normally you are fine. Our customers are normally fine with just the certificate, with the NMR here, um, with the mass spectrometry, that you can see here and uh, with the infrared um, spectroscopy data that you can see here as well. So that is normally provided with our um, reference standards for impurities when it comes to identity. And then we start with the purity section. We do an HPLC profile of our impurity. Um, we give the conditions here in, um, in the um, certificate and then the chromatogram and the percentage report is, is provided here as, as well. That's not enough. HPLC purity is by far not enough to have an idea about the assay or the purity. Well, the purity, yes, but, but not the assay of your material because HPLC cannot see water and cannot see the residual solvents that you have in your standard. And um, that can be uh, quite some, uh, some percentages and you want to get that um, 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 regarded as well in order to get the assay later in the right way. So we also check on water content. We do that with Carl Fischer titration. We also check on residual solvents with, uh, with uh, um, um, HNMR. With that, you can very nicely estimate the, um, the residual solvents there. And then the final result is given here, and the assay is calculated by the 100% method um, according to the formula that is also shown on the certificates there. So there's a lot of information on that, how we um, characterize our reference standards. So that is what we call an impurity reference standard and please differ between a reference standard and a research material. There are a lot of companies out offering research materials. Those are very, very good for identification purposes, but when it comes to quantifying the level of a certain impurity, then um, I would uh, say stay with, uh, with those materials here. And uh, also our customers are saying that. For example, that is uh, here a German subsidiary of uh, one of the world top three generic manufacturers. 
Um, their side in, in Germany where we have uh, good connections, very good connections, where we have connections to, to all the top 10 generic manufacturers and, and, and after that as well. But that one here, they told us our uh, impurity standards are always accepted by, by the regulation authorities um, because the C of A is so detailed, so nicely done and uh, very clear um, structured. So, so they are very fond of our certificates. But they also gave, uh, gave us the information sometimes we don't see this impurity, the impurity that we need in your catalog. So we need to go to another um, manufacturer there and uh, most of the certificates from other manufacturers, they have much more, uh, much less analytical information on the C of A and very often they are not accepted there. So that is what I wanted to tell you here. Be aware of the difference between an impurity reference standard and, uh, and a research material. Research materials are good for research, for identification, as soon as you want to quantify the level of an impurity in your drug product or in your drug substance, you should stay with an impurity reference standard. And when you don't find it in our catalog, ask for a custom synthesis. We are always happy to consider that and uh, provide you with a quote on that as well. Right, so apart from the client's experience, the C of A is relevant for the corresponding use. A research material with the pool purity and assay information, I, I said it already, not really suitable for the quantitative purposes. You should definitely not use it for uh, determining an API assay figure and also you should probably not do it uh, for, for an impurity level. The full assay characterization should be preferred, so HPLC, water residue solvents, and for API assay um, even more, you should probably do even more there. But that's another, capit uh, another chapter that we will not deal today with. Okay. So we are at the last point here and we are already, uh, I need to hurry up because I'm, I'm, uh, um, I'm short of time. Um, I will stay here, you can give me later your business cards to receive the presentation and also for questions I will be outside here so in order not to disturb the next speaker. So let's quickly go through the practical validation examples here as well. Um, validation guideline from ICH Q2 and um, I have brought an example with me how you can check with impurity standards on the accuracy of the testing for impurities. But first of all, we will have how, on a look on how you can uh, check on the specificity of your assay method, for example. So specificity of the HPLC method, you should, should show the absence of interference of the solvent, the matrix, mobile phase, and uh, maybe of the specified, especially of the specified impurities for, your AP, uh, for the HPLC assay method. So you, you take uh, chromatograms of the blank of the impurity A alone of the placebo, the drug, subs, uh, the, the drug product placebo, um, and then the specified impurities A, B, and, uh, and C here in that case, the API is here, and then in the end you have that one here, and you can see that you have baseline um, uh, um, separation here, so the specificity on a visual level, that's quite good. You can also do it from a statistical approach there. Um, you set up two analytical series uh, of the drug product and one of those you spike with impurities, preferably to the maximum concentration there, and then you do statistical analysis like we have done here. So series one here and series two, that's the one with the impurity spiked, and you can see there is no statistical difference here in the value, so with that you can show then the specificity of your assay method, for example. So very helpful impurities here uh, to that regard to, uh, to do that and, and very nicely uh, accepted by um, the, um, the regulation authorities, of course. <clears throat> when you check on the accuracy of an impurity determination itself, then also, of course, um, that can be of help, impurity reference standards can be there of help. Either you spike with them into the drug substance or you, uh, you do um, the calibration curve with it. Alter um, ideally, you would have two different sources of that impurity. So one with which you spike, the other one with which you do the calibration curve. Um, <clears throat> so here you can see, um, according to ICH, you need to, uh, to do it in a range from reporting level to 120% of the specification. So from reporting level 0.05% to 0.18%, you do then here for a 300 milligram sample. And uh, that is on the next, shown on the, uh, on, the, on the next slide here. And they are also saying in Q3, in the, in, the, in the Q2, in the guideline there, that the accuracy should be accessed by, uh, assessed by uh, samples spiked with known amounts of impurities. So their impurity reference standards are quite good to, to be used as well. So that is here then one, uh, you, you look on the recovery that you find for the amount that you edit, the amount that you, uh, that you found, then the recovery rate and then the mean value there. So that is a way how we can check on the accuracy there of your um, impurity determination as well. 
So that's why uh, how you can, uh, can uh, use those materials here. Um, I'm at the end of my presentation, also at the end of my time, but I quickly go through the last slides. We are part of the LGC group, and LGC, our science and technology section at LGC, um, headquartered in the United Kingdom, nearby London, is acting as the National Metrology Institute for chemical and biochemical measurements in the United Kingdom. To that regard, we are comparable to the NIST in the US, and based on that experience that we have and, and the analytical knowledge that is flowing in all our productions, we are also uh, a major manufacturer of pharmaceutical reference materials. Um, they are manufactured not in Engl England, but in Germany. That is a site 60 kilometers in the south of Berlin. And uh, should you ever be in Berlin, give us a call. We are always happy to show you around our facility so that you can see how we produce our impurity reference standards. We have over 3,000 of those standards there. We have constantly new developments. Recently, we set up primary standards for APIs as well. Um, we have set up for CPHI and I would like to, to tell you, come to our hall there, to our booth and ask for the brochure. We have now made a reference to the USP description for 320 of our impurities so that you can uh, compare them with the, um, um, with the description in, in the USP. And we are in most cases, we are less expensive price per milligram wise compared to the USP. Plus we have that certificate that you have seen. In, in our presentation here. And always, if you leave the grounds of the monograph, it is always good to work with materials that are um, issued with a certificate of, uh, of analysis. We are ISO accredited and we do contract services as well, custom analysis, characterization of customer materials. And uh, what we do is there, we, we offer service modules for our customers. They can book every step of making a reference standard. They can book with us. They can also go with us through the whole chain. And uh, depending on, uh, on what you do and how many bottles you want to have here, you see here we set up a primary secondary standard for itraconazole, bottling 45 units here, and the unit cost is 150 euros. And the more units you want to have and the longer the contract is running with you the less the unit price will be so it can come down in the last example it can come down to uh, sorry to to less than 30 euros and for that it doesn't make sense to set up a secondary standard anymore use the primary directly for example much better accuracy there um, on your products so as soon as you work apart from the monographs this makes sense for you especially when you do a very often a routine test on your products with such a material so thank you very much for your attention. Um, if you have questions, I will be outside of the booth. If you want the presentation, please give me your card and I will send them to you once I'm back in Germany. Um, otherwise, if you have questions, uh, come to our uh, um, hall as well and, and ask for the brochure. If you have questions later, please send me an email uh, to christianseine at lgcstandards.com. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.